Awesome. Yeah, have you got a timer? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just wait all of about 10 seconds for everyone to sit down. Hi, my name's Tyson. Uh, I'm from Melbourne, a crew called Common Code. We're in Abbotsford. Um, we do all sorts of cool things. Um, and I've been a bit blessed that uh, I got the chance to work on a project that uh, got released as open source and now I get to show you guys. So uh, we're going to talk about this. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I support the planet using public transport and living within reasonable means and uh, I hope you all do the same. I support humanity by funding the United Nations Refugee Agency. Uh, onto the tech side, I started using PostgreSQL back in 1999 and um, I've been using Django since working with uh, Curtis Maloney or Funky Bob, one of the core contributors, in January 2007. So I've been in the Django game for a little while. Um, so what's this project? What am I trying to do? Well, Meteor. I don't know. How many have heard of Meteor? Quite a few of you. It's becoming quite popular. Um, it's real time. And some of you go, well, what does that really mean? We'll get to that in a minute. But it's not Python. Hmm. I quite like Python. Um, Meteor uses MongoDB, and that I really don't like. We'll get to that in a minute too. But it does have this cool thing called latency compensation. And if you're trying to build an app, or if you're trying to build a website that's nice and like, has a nice user experience, latency compensation is awesome. Meteor can be used to write iOS and Android apps as well. It's a nice feature, so you can go and you know, deploy your code and um, you know, send it off to the App Store, send it off to the Google Play Store. That's pretty cool too. All right, what don't I like about schemaless? Well, there's no schema. That means no consistency resulting in bugs. Bugs are bad, right? No referential integrity results in more bugs. That really sucks. No transactions across collections. Now, I'm talking specifically about MongoDB here which results in even more bugs. So why would you choose to use something like Meteor if you're almost guaranteed you're going to hit one of these bugs? Well, PostgreSQL provides schemaless anyway, so what was the point of using uh, MongoDB in the first place? Um, so people say, oh, but Mongo's fast. <coughs> well, no, it's not, and it uses more space. And, well, you get the idea. PostgreSQL is king. Meteor, what is it? Well, up here we get a nice little diagram that shows us. Um, essentially, it's split into two halves, client and server. Um, and it uses this DDP protocol to have the two communicate. So you have your data store. Recently, SQL and other sources were added to um, Meteor. Uh, so this diagram has been updated, but when I started this back in uh, February, it was really only having MongoDB. Um, so you've got collections with documents inside your Mongo data store, and you've got a way of publishing uh, information, and then a client data cache um, that resides you know, in JavaScript on the browser or in your app that has a uh, local copy of data that can be queried by your JavaScript code. And then you've got templating libraries and all sorts of things on top of that that handle the dynamic nature of your data and saying, all right, if a new object, if a new document gets added to the collection, then it needs to get rendered, for example. All right? And then we've got um, all of your component logic in here for the uh, front end. And then you've got you know, how you're actually deploying it as a website or perhaps you're deploying to mobile. So, you know, I, I like what Meteor does on the client side, but on the server side, well, it really sucks. Django DDP, this is what we're talking about today, um, lets you use Django below the line between client and server. This is awesome. So, the basics. It implements a DDP server, like Meteor does. But it replaces the Meteor server, so you're no longer running Node.js on your server. Hooray! We're back into Python. 
Uh, it allows clients, browsers or apps, to subscribe to publications. And it pushes Django model updates in real time via WebSockets. Ooh, real time WebSockets. But hang on a second, Django doesn't do that, does it? Uh, latency compensated RPC method calls and responses. We'll touch on latency compensation shortly too. So, it's got some limitations at the moment. Uh, it's relatively immature. Uh, the live query work in particular is work in progress. It works, but it's uh, in flux. It's PostgreSQL only. Uh, it's because of one of the technology decisions that I made. Um, and this is a good thing, really. Uh, it relies on Django signals. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from putting um, support in to use PostgreSQL triggers if you want to avoid that or possibly doing some other things. But for the moment, it's a uh, limitation that Django DDP has. Uh, it used to be that it didn't serve media or client files. Now it does. This is pretty cool. So real-time and latency compensation. OK, so a client view will update. We're talking about at the browser side. Within milliseconds after data is updated and subsequently dispatched from the server. Oh, that's the whole point of this, right? We want it to be really fast. Uh, we don't want to have to um, poll every 10 seconds and then figure out, oh, hang on, you know, the data changed you know, eight seconds ago. We're kind of getting this a bit late. It needs to be really quick. Uh, immediately, the data will be, well, the client view will be updated as client interactions take place. When I say immediately, I mean before the data is even sent off to the server. This has some huge benefits, and you might be wondering, well, hang on a second. What if the server doesn't like what you're trying to do? Well, the short answer is that uh, Meteor, the client side, will just roll back your view state if it sees that the update to the server came back with a different response. So, Python side. How do we make Python do these neat tricks, make it fast, and all the other things? Well, we use G-Event for concurrency. G-Event's pretty cool, um, and now it's got Python 3 support, so it sounds like I've got some work to do in making sure that uh, Django DDP supports Python 3. Um, it uses a fast event loop based on libEV. It monkey patches the standard library to change all of the blocking calls, for example, a DNS lookup or reading from a file, to as instead make them non-blocking and return back to the libEV event loop, which is pretty cool. So you get lightweight execution units based on greenlet and green threads. No callbacks, promises, or other fluff. I mean, Twisted, for example, when you want to write callbacks, you've got this extra layer in between. You can't just write the Python code you're used to. Right? You have to go and use callbacks. Well, that means that you're going to have to write a new function declaration and other things, and you're essentially writing more red code. I don't know how many of you are aware of what red code and green code is. Green code is the code that your application absolutely has to run to do the work it needs to do. Red code is all of the extra baggage to make your code work with the framework that you're trying to use. Right? I don't like red code. The APIs that, that are designed in Django DDP promote a lots of green code, not much red code at all. And did I mention it's really fast? Well, I thought I'd uh, make sure that the DDP implementation that I've done meets with DDP's uh, test suite that someone has published online. So testing against Meteor. Have we got lost audio? There we go. Testing against Meteor. I managed to uh, see that their service running on Node.js on my local machine, uh, which is a pretty fast machine, um, took 1.12 seconds. And then Jeng that was the uh, average over three runs. Um, and then Django DDP, 1.1 seconds. So uh, hang on a second. Wasn't Node.js meant to be really fast? Oh, well. So how am I routing messages? I'm using asynchronous notification. It's already part of the Django PostgreSQL stack because 
Postgres has it built in by default, and Django has support for Postgres, and more importantly, for Psycho PG2, which supports green thread, um, you know, it supports GPN. Unless, of course, you're a MySQL weenie. Um, but here's the really cool thing. So no new services or infrastructure to be deployed. What? Did you hear that? No new infrastructure. So many WebSocket applications these days require something like Crossbar or Redis. Quite frankly, I'm sick of it. We don't need it. You're adding all new uh, infrastructure when you've already got a back end that is across all of your front end web servers and it's Postgres. Postgres is your unified connection between all of your front end web servers. So we're just using Django and PostgreSQL. Hooray! So how do we do it? We use listen and notify. It's extended SQL syntax. It seems to be pretty unique to PostgreSQL. I haven't seen the uh, equivalent in MySQL. I believe that uh, Microsoft SQL Server has something like it, and Oracle may have something like it too, but not many other uh, database engines have it. Uh, I've been speaking with Facebook and supposedly they've got some uh, open source published version of MySQL that does support uh, asynchronous connections. I don't know if they've got the equivalent. So how does the Postgres one work anyway? Well, it's really simple. You notify on a channel, which is just a string, and with an optional payload up to eight kilobyte of just string data. So then Anyone who has done listen on that particular channel will then get this asynchronous, hey, you've got some data. Nice and easy. So the beauty of Notify, there's some other cool things about it. It works with transactions. So notifications are only sent after your transaction is successfully committed. Hey, let's go and make this change. And did it all go OK? Good. If there is a problem and you have to roll back, the notifications are discarded, which means you don't have to do any gymnastics to handle error conditions. You don't have to go and publish a, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to send that message afterwards. Demo time. <laughs> Demos can be fun, can't they? All right. So what we've got. We have a very, very simple little uh, app. I'll show you the code. So front end, we've got a few things in here. Importantly, uh, this is actually using React as well. So let's see what we've got. I might just reduce the font size a bit so you can see it better. Is that still legible? Up the back, yep. Um, React only very recently added support for using, uh, oh sorry, Meteor just added support for using React. And here we have um, a React class with the Meteor mix-in. And that lets us use this get Meteor data thing and say, all right, I want to subscribe to presentations. This is on client side. Um, and I'm actually going to assign it to a variable that I can go and play with later because I like to debug things, otherwise the scoping's all wrong. Um, and return a dictionary with presentations set to all of the presentations sorted by title. Uh, when I render, um, then I'm going to render a, a set of list items for the presentation, I, well, the presentation title and subtitle. And that's essentially all it's doing. So that's the client side. And what we're going to do now is show you the back end. So I've got some way too complex Django models here. Uh, I was hoping that I'd actually be able to present this using this particular tool. That obviously hasn't happened. <laughs> um, but here we go. So we've got presentation. It's got uh, title and subtitle. 
And now, DDP, uh, it looks a bit like um, the admin with auto discover. So you go and register which things you want to be seen via your um, DDP connection. And I've registered a collection and I've registered a publication. A collection is essentially a one-to-one -one on a model. Uh, and I can see there that you know, there is my uh, association between the presentation collection and which model it represents. And a publication which says, all right, given that uh, you want to subscribe to something, how do I go and get them? So here's a really simple example. It says, just give me all the presentations. I don't care. Um, but obviously, you can put some filters in there as well. Uh, so now, assuming it's running, it is indeed. Let's go back to here. So we're going to split window. Now, the messages that we see in here are WebSocket frames. So WebSockets, uh, for those that don't know, uh, send frames between client and server and server and client. And those frames for Meteor are in an extended JSON format. So it's JSON format, but with support for date times, which is really nice. And don't know if you noticed, um, Django DDP also supports SSL. I've got a uh, self-signed cert here, so it's throwing lots of warnings, but there it is running with SSL out of the box. Uh, let's add a presentation. So Django DDP is awesome. Subtitle. Uh, so is Common Code. Common Code are an awesome crew. They host the Melb Django meetings in Melbourne um, and they do some really cool stuff. So I'm now going to save it. There we go. I don't know if any of you noticed, but um, it was so quick that the Meteor side over here on the left actually returned quicker than the admin on the right. <laughs> uh, there's lots of good reasons for that, actually. So Django, to render this view, had to go and do database queries and things and essentially go and get all of the data again. But of course, at the time that the data was being saved, Django already had the data at hand at the time of the post. So of course, it does a post, redirect, and get. At the time that the post occurs, if you've got all the data at hand, you can then send that notify signal to your database. All of your web front end servers can then receive that information and then just dispatch it via a WebSocket connection. And then, of course, you get the redirect and it goes, oh, hang on, I've got to go over here. So that's the response coming back. And then, of course, it does a get and then goes, oh, hang on a second. I don't know anything about the context of this uh, request, so I'm going to go and get all the information again. So it does a fresh database query. That really sucks for Django. Um, breaking out of the request response cycle and using WebSockets has allowed us to go way quicker. In fact, now that that data is already there on the client side, if I went and added another one, of course, does it need to go and query from the database I'd make another request to get that first information again. No, it's already there, it's cached. So it makes things really fast. Uh, I mentioned I like to take public transport. It's because I care for the environment. Um, this sort of thing means that your server is under less load. Because rather than every client saying, hey, give me the updated copy of all of the data, it's only been emitted once. Which means that your servers are under less load which means you can use less infrastructure, which means we're using less power and manufacturing less computers. This is great. So latency compensation. This also helps in a great deal as well. So if I were to put in a, um, a method that did some updates from the client, we would have then um, got the ability to get instant feedback like the client will go and insert into its local cached version the copy of the data that you want to change. Right? It will go and update the view immediately. You get snappy response. 
And then it can go off to your back-end server, and if your back-end server takes three seconds to respond, it doesn't really matter. Right? You've got three seconds, and you've then just dispatched it to all of your clients. That's really cool. This scales out because your front-end servers, whichever front-end server it is that happens to receive the request, is going to do the processing locally, emit the uh, notify message, commit the transaction, and then as the transaction is committed, the notification will be pushed out to all of the other front-end servers, who will then update all of the clients. The notification includes all of the data they need to you know, push the data out. They don't have to do another database hit to go and say, oh, I saw the notify now, I need to go and get the data. It was all in that eight kilobyte um, packet. So we've just saved the environment a little bit by having a lot less demand on our infrastructure to get timely response. This is really cool. I don't know how we're going for time. I can't see a timer in front of me. Um, but I suppose I can let you go early for afternoon tea and you can get first picks. Um, key learnings from Meteor. The synchronized document ID that they've got is awesome because it allows for latency compensation. Latency compensation, as we've seen, is really awesome. Meteor password hashing sucked. Um, I've addressed it by releasing a package. I'm trying to... Uh, work with the Meteor community to try and get their system updated. Essentially, they tried to use um, bcrypt and then sort of stopped using it and now essentially they're just doing an SHA of a password and every time you update the hash mechanism on the server, they have to update the client and all sorts of funny things. So um, don't do that, just use account secure, it'll work. Um, and Meteor helps you shoot yourself in the foot it defaults to insecure because it auto-publishes absolutely everything and it lets everyone modify everything by default. That really sucks. If you see any uh, Meteor apps, you can probably go and have a poke around and see what's going on. Django DDP is uh, not doing that, of course. It's very explicit about things. Key learnings about Python and Django. So spending a bit of time in the Meteor world has uh, taught me a couple of things. Uh, WebSocket support in Django is absolutely woeful. I'm using gevent WebSocket um, and essentially sidestepping Django. Uh, there is some work afoot on breaking out of the request response cycle using channels. That looks really promising. Um, so I uh, welcome the chance to use that. Um, the channels implementation, uh, they've set some lofty goals of essentially saying to support Django channels, your backend uh, notification system, whether it be crossbar, IO, or otherwise, needs to support different channel names and up to five megabytes in each payload. So Django DDP might end up having to resort to dumping data into a table um, to get that five megabytes in. Um, and adding packages to Django projects sucks because there's nothing like Meteor add foo or Meteor add Tyson Club colon accounts hyphen secure. Um, perhaps we can work towards improving the ecosystem somewhat. It does make it very easy for new developers to go and you know, plug in new components into their system. Uh, acknowledgements. Meerkat, uh, they've just had their piece of software released uh, yesterday, um, that MVP, and they've essentially funded this work and we're very thankful for letting them release this as open source. Uh, who else? David Burles, expert guidance on how DDP works in Meteor. Uh, Brenton Cleland for discussions on the security model for publications. And Mohammed Tanish for the DDP test suite. And Daryl at the front here, um, he's the director of Common Code uh, for essentially providing the motivation and the support to uh, let this happen as well. Uh, Common Code's an awesome place to work. Uh, we'll support you in doing this sort of thing. Um, if you're in Melbourne, come and check us out. We host the Melbourne Django meetings. Question time.
hello. Um, question. So say you have uh, multiple servers, each running Django DDP, and um, client A is connected to server A, and client B is connected to server B. My understanding of the Django um, signals signals is that it actually happens in process and it happens on the server. So w if client if client A and client B with the same with the same server are doing a viewing the same page and then you update it and then that sends it, will client B actually get the notification because it won't know all of the clients that are actually connected to it through, uh, through server B? So the signals are only used for the pre-save and post-save on the model, which then gets translated at post-save into the notify call, which gets pushed all the way back out to the database and then comes back in um, so that you then see the notification and they, all of the servers react from the notification coming in. Right, so there's th three database hits? So it will be, um, A has signal for pre-save and post-save. Post-save occurs, Yep. notify happens. Yep. Right? That's as much as Django DDP needs to do. And in fact, you can plug Django DDP in just using that alone. You don't have to do the WebSockets. You can do that much and then say, all right, we're going to use um, that for our you know, big Django DDP, like our main Django project, and not use G-Event and WebSockets in that thing, and then connect to the same database your new Django DDP project and have it do the special stuff. So you don't actually have to do much. If you can just support the signals in your existing Django app, then you can leave that essentially unchanged. You put Django DDP into the installed apps, and that's it it'll start emitting those notify events for you. And then, of course, yeah, when you've got something listening for them, namely the DDP server itself, mm -hmm. then it will be able to do the publications and such for you. Cool. Thanks, great talk. Um, is there any, already any uh, front-end editing part integrated that you don't have to reload the page on the client side? Uh, so Meteor has what they call hot code push, and uh, Django DDP doesn't support that yet. Um, there's no particular reason why we couldn't, except that I've been focused on production deployments, in which case um, there hasn't necessarily been the need for it. Uh, but certainly, uh, pull requests are welcome. I'd love to see uh, a separate uh, G-Event thread watching the directory structure and pushing out the, the client updates as they occur. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, two questions. One, has you ever seen whether it's possible to use multiple DDP servers with, um, with the media front end, or is it just one per? You can. Um, so with Meteor, you can create a new um, connection to multiple servers, and then essentially when you define your collection of data, um, you specify which connection it belongs to. So absolutely, yes, that's possible. Cool. Yeah, just thought you could mix front, um, you know, mix say Django and then Node and stuff like that as well. Without yes, you certainly can. Mm. Um, also, there are lots of DDP client implementations out there. I'm not aware of any other server implementations aside from Meteor itself. Um, so there's uh, bindings for lots of different languages if you want to integrate this into something else. Cool. And my second question was, um, you're talking about potentially using it in, um, in production from your point of view. I've played around a bit with Meteor. It's been a rough around the edges, both client and server side. How are you guys finding it, especially when you're, say, bolting Django at the back end? Um, we found it surprisingly easy. The Meteor development essentially happens as it normally would, except that they're not dealing with the um, server side code. It leaves your Django devs um, to you know, work on the implementation of API calls and such. Uh, the Meteor side seems to work rather well, and in fact, comments from David Burles, um, rather strong in the Meteor community, seems to be that Django DDP doesn't have a lot of the issues that Meteor has on the back end, in particular with security. Thanks. Um, as far as, sorry, um, so as far as uh, Django DDP, how it uses G-Event for its web sockets, um, what sort of, uh, what sort of, what were the reasons for not using a uh, actual um, 
event loops such as Twisted with um, Autobahn to run it side by side rather than running the whole thing in uh, micro threads? Um, so the primary reason is that I'm, I've produced this as something that can be plugged into a project and that you can write lots of green code. Right? I don't like the idea of having to write some special way of dealing with things. Um, so I'd much rather that the implementation that you know, the devs you guys use, if you're going to use this, is very, very clean. And callbacks can be, um, they're definitely a departure from what uh, happens in the Python standard library. Uh, they're very new um, for things like uh, the Tulip library, so to speak, in Python 3. Um, but Twisted, uh, there seems to be some sentiment that it is overly complex and I wanted to avoid that complexity. Okay, um, and as far as uh, the red-green code, um, would, would not wrapping it in, using Crochet, which has Twisted in a thread, um, with the call through thread, which lets you do block, uh, asynchronous operations in a blocking thing, so there's that very little of that Red green code. Um, would something like that be interesting to the project? Certainly. Um, so the G event WebSocket back end, I can't see any reason why it couldn't be abstracted out and uh, essentially try and work uh, around some of these things. But the monkey patching of the standard library means that um, the Django side of code just works. Um, you know, it can deal with the multiple simultaneous uh, concurrent queries and such, and it just works. Right, cool. Uh, thanks, Tyson. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in learning a little bit about, um, say, there's the goals of DDP and then uh, WAMP, um, which is sort of a web WebSocket protocols um, implemented in multiple languages. Sure. And I'm um, wondering if you can make a comment about, say, the ubiquity of DDP and what m this Meteor and Django combination might offer versus Autobahn crossbar. Uh, so the requirements for this particular project that this was created for was to essentially integrate with Meteor. Uh, Meteor doesn't use WAMP, which is essentially heading towards standardisation. Um, but it's really quite simple. Um, I mean, JSON on the wire makes sense. Um, an RPC method where you can go and call a method, make a method call, get responses, um, and then publish and sub oh, subscribing to uh, changes. Um, DDP is actually quite a clean implementation of all of that, including the latency compensation as a factor which uh, WAMP doesn't seem to address, although in theory you could add it to any method call that you wanted to, So, uh, but it would be a, an afterthought as opposed to a there from the start. Um, and would you place a bet on which way to go forward? Well, Django DDP really could have been called uh, Django Real Time because I guess um, there wouldn't be too much involved in making it do WAMP as well. Uh, it would be a bit of a, a bit of work to get it to happen, but I could see that it could easily be adapted to do precisely that. So, um, yeah, Django real time, if you want to call it that. But uh, its current name is Django DDP. Okay, thank you very much, Tyson. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh